Welcome to another edition of Boxed In, the podcast here that we're doing at Yahoo Sports while we're all quarantined because we figure the best and most most healthy way to get through this is to argue with each other. And today we're going to be having a nice little debate here between Therese Paler and Jay Busby. They're going to try to convince me what is the best conspiracy in sports. Now, I've got Therese here and he's representing the Ali list in Phantom Punch and Jay Busby, who was I actually ruled against in a previous episode. So I don't know how he's. I don't know how he's feeling about getting me <laughs> as a judge again. Uh, he's going to be represented. The appeal's already been filed. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I, I, I believe that this is going to like the Ninth Circuit or whatever. Uh, Jay Busby is going to be arguing for the NBA drafts frozen envelope. Now, gentlemen, I, I'm I'm going to let you all have your opening statements here. But before we do that, I want to make it known that I don't know what either of these conspiracies are. And I also just want to say for everyone else that's out there at home, while we're talking about conspiracy theories here about sports, with everything that's going on in the world right now, don't go Googling other conspiracy theories. Let's stick to the sports world here. That's just my PSA off the top. Um, Now, before we get to the opening statement, so Therese, I I I do want to make a note here. Uh... How do you feel like how did you usurp Charles Robinson, who's like the conspiracy corner guy on your guys' <laughs> Yahoo Sports NFL podcast? I believe that he ceded this argument to me uh, uh, because I feel so strongly about it, which is, I think, a check mark in my corner. So I am uh, I'm ready to go like Ali and Ali list in one. All right. Well, let, let's. Waste no more time then. Give me the opening statement, Therese, for your conspiracy. OK, so after Ali list in one which was a hard-fought win by Ali, in which he yelled the iconic, I am the greatest line. This Ali listed to was one of the most controversial fights of all time, arguably the most controversial of all time. Uh, to this point, remember, Sonny Liston had lost two fights his whole career. And the previous time he faced Ali, he went six rounds with him despite having a bum shoulder and being undertrained. okay? And then in this fight, he goes down in round one making this one of the shortest heavyweight title bouts in history? How? Liston was 6'1", 218, and he had never been knocked out. He had a grant to this point, he never once been knocked out. He also had a granite chin. In 54 career fights, I was able to find he was only knocked down three times in his career. Once in this fight, very, very early in his pro career, um, against a guy named Marty Marshall, who... And look, Liston is a tough guy. In that fight, he fought the whole thing with a broken jaw and then beat the guy up so bad by the end, Marshall had stepped out of the ring. He was done. And then Ali Liston, too, obviously. And then late in his career against Leotis Martin when he was 40. So not a long history here of uh, Sonny Liston being... Uh, uh, having a glass... No, it's the complete opposite. He's a hard guy to knock down, let alone knock out. So, wrapping this up here, let's talk about a couple things here we got to keep in mind. Number one, he got knocked out on Ali's third punch of the night. So, a man who was only knocked down in his career a few times and only knocked out a few times over 20 years went down on Ali's third punch of the night? People hadn't even settled down into their seats yet. Please. Secondly, Liston was also sponsored by the mob early in his career. And there's lots of history involving guys having to take dives. Okay? So there, people were connecting that. Also, Liston didn't even complain about the clear breach of, like, boxing rules after the match. Um, and Ali couldn't believe that he was down. He yelled at Liston when he was down that nobody will believe this. And he kept asking his handlers, did I hit him? Even Ali didn't know he knocked him out. <laughs> it's like, how we kind of sit that? The last thing I'll say, if you want to say he was that that Sonny Liston was washed up at this point, remember this. He fought lots, he fought many more fights over the next five years. And his he only lost once. And his last fight came against Chuck Webner, who went on to fight for the heavyweight title. And by the end of that match, Webner needed 72 stitches and he had a broken cheekbone and nose. He was done. So you will never convince me Sonny Liston didn't take a dive in that fight. I, I got to say, right off the top, Therese is bringing heat with mob connections, which that <laughs> rings home. All right. Look, I don't know. I don't know that much about boxing, but I, I do know. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Look, I don't know that much about the mob, but I'm, I'm at least well, I know that that is some sketchy. That's some sketchy stuff we're talking about here. So, look, Jay. 
tell me about this frozen envelope. Uh, and already, again, I got to say, you're in a little bit of a hole here after after Therese brings the hammer with the with the mob talk. <laughs> I, I tell you what, I mean, I feel like I'm on the set of Goodfellas here. I know one thing, regardless of how this turns out, Therese and I are going to Vegas to watch a heavyweight fight. I want to see this guy <laughs> in the stands, see how he reacts to every heavyweight fight. This guy's you, you got to have him next year. Anyway, I want to cast your mind back to the 1980s and the NBA. There's two big factors here that we have to think about. First of all, the NBA at that time, remember what Michael Jordan said about that era in the last dance, traveling cocaine circus. The NBA was <laughs> maybe, maybe the fifth most popular sport in the in America at the time. It wasn't anywhere near as popular as it was now. It was struggling. It was difficult to, to, to get people to watch the games. Now, you take into that, you take that into account. You also take into account the fact that the game was completely different. Every team had to have a big man. You built, you got your big man, you got your giant, and then you built your team around him. And in 1985, the biggest of big men, the biggest big man of all time, Patrick Ewing, was coming out after spending four years at Georgetown. Imagine, imagine how stoked we would be if LeBron or Kobe had spent four years in college getting more and more popular, and we were waiting to see what they were going to do. This is what the hype was like for Patrick Ewing. And at this time, you had seven teams in the NBA lottery. This was the first year of the NBA lottery. I'll get to that in a little bit. But this was the first year of the lottery. You had seven teams, each one of them with a 14% chance. One of those teams, the New York Knicks. What do you do when you want to have you want to have your league get more prestige, get more eyeballs instantly? You put the biggest star in the biggest city. And somehow, somehow, amazingly enough, New York won out and got that 14% chance, turned it into Patrick Ewing. How did they do it? Well, David Stern was the man who selected the envelope out of the drum. You've seen these drums before. You see them at, at, at church bingo parlors and so forth. This is what David Stern reached in and grabbed an envelope. Now, the way that he did it, I'll talk more about that later on, but the way that he did it, there's a lot of suspicion surrounding this. You could Zapruder film this right down to the bottom, most granular level, but however it happened, whether he knew, whether he didn't, there's a lot of suspicion surrounding how how David Stern grabbed that one envelope, opened it up, and Patrick Ewing, amazingly enough, went to exactly the right team that he needed to go to at exactly the right time in the very first NBA draft. Right, interesting. So, so far, we've got uh, the key threads here are a little bit of mob connections one to, on Therese's side, and Jay, we've got a fishy church parlor bingo uh, <laughs> lottery system here. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot. This is There's some interesting things going on here after the opening statement. Statements, but Jay, I'm gonna throw it to you for the first question, and, and we and we got to start here. I mean, what is the key thread that makes your conspiracy true? First of all, you've heard about the frozen envelope. You mentioned at the opening. I went and did a little experiment myself to to figure out if this was true or not. I stuck an envelope in my freezer. That is the level of dedication that I have. <laughs> oh, right. Jay, let's oh, go. I've got, these, I've got these envelopes here, and I went and lo and behold, look at this. New York Knicks, <laughs> pull it right out. Here's the problem, though. I had it in the freezer for about an hour before this show started, and it was room temperature within about 30 seconds. So the frozen envelope theory, I think that's BS. I'm going to go call BS on my own conspiracy theory from that standpoint. The bigger issue is the dented corner. Now, I didn't dent the corner of this one, but just imagine that the corner was dented. If you go back and you watch how those envelopes are put into the drum, there's a guy named Jack Wagner. He's, he's an accountant from Ernst & Winnie. OK, he takes three envelopes, throws them in one, two, three. The fourth envelope, he pauses. He throws this one and it dings right off the center pole. And then he throws the other three envelopes in the remaining three envelopes. They don't touch anything. David Stern goes in, pulls out an envelope. It is very clearly dented, very clearly dented. Now, why did I mention that man's name? Jack Wagner, Ernst and Winnie, because of this. Ernst and Winnie was the accounting firm for Gulf and Western. Who is Gulf and Western? The company that owned the Knicks at that point. So it all connects together. It all connects together. It's all of a piece. Gulf and Western got Ernst and Winnie to make the envelope dented so that Pat, so that David Stern would pull it out and Patrick Ewing would end up on the Knicks. End of story. Okay, I mean, Jay just went full like Charlie Day in front of the, the damn board, <laughs> connected all the things together. I need, the, I need those, don't I? I need those little threads, don't I? Yeah, exactly. No, that this is that's perfect. Um, I, I love it. I, that actually makes a lot of sense to me. I also love that you disproved the larger point about the conspiracy and then came back with a second hammer to drop there. That's excellent. Love it, Jay. Now, Therese, the question goes to you. What is the key thread that makes your conspiracy true? Well, I got a couple. And the first is that apparently Ali never scored another knockout punch. 
with the, the anchor punch that he threw. That was called an anchor punch that he threw to knock out Liston. Apparently, that was his only knockout of that type of punch in his career. But that's not all. After watching this fight, like a list of former champions thought it was fixed. Jack Dempsey, Floyd Patterson, Joe Lewis, Gene Tunney. Uh, a lot of them just like, it, they felt that the knockdown was real, but the knockout was fake. And then there's three things here that I want people to really kind of keep in mind here is that we have some pretty strong anecdotal evidence that, you know, this thing was real. In a 1995 HBO documentary about Liston, Johnny Taco, who owned a boxing gym in Vegas, said that he spoke with a mobster who told before the rematch, who told him that the fight was going to end in the first round and he's lucky he's not going to go. Lo and behold, that's what happened. Later in that documentary, a former FBI agent said that there had definitely been a fix in that fight. Also in there, um, a boxing manager from Chicago with mob ties said Liston's wife told the ex-champion that as long as he had to lose the fight, he should go down early to avoid any chance of getting hurt. And the last thing is this, Liston cop to it. To the Sports Illustrated writer Mark Cram, he said years later that Liston told him, quote, that guy Ali was crazy. I didn't want anything to do with him. And the Muslims were coming up, were coming up. Who needed that? So I went down. I wasn't hit. Uh, Therese just provided us expert witnesses with other boxers there. Uh, he provided us historical evidence via the HBO documentary. And looks like we got a confession, too. That's a, <laughs> that's, a tri, that's a trifecta. <laughs> so, so hang on. Is it a conspiracy theory then if it's true? Do, do, aren't we out of the realm of conspiracy theory? Good good point. That's what you can say. <laughs> but here's the thing. People, people don't necessarily believe that that's how that went down. There's still people who really genuinely think that, um, that Ali knocked out Liston. And then, to be fair, Liston didn't tell that story to everybody. Like, there were other people where he was just like, yeah, he got me, and all. So, like, it's it's in the ether. We don't know. But there is at least one documented confession from Sonny Liston, even though that was not a consistent story from him. That's also a question, too, because, you know, he gave kind of a different reason than you did up top, but you said there were some mob connections here or something like that, and then obviously then he's just saying he didn't want any piece of him or whatever. So what? It, what is he really, why did he really take that dive? Was it for the mob? connection or was it because he just didn't want a piece of Ali but see it's the way you said it that really matters you said why did he take that dive it don't really matter he took the dive True. which goes against the concept of that being a fair fight great point Therese all right but let's get to our second question here and this of course has to deal with the fallout of each incident which which one of these had the larger impact? And Therese, I'm going to let you start this one. All right, I'll make this one quicker than my other rambling points. Um, <laughs> first of all, Ali Liston to provide it arguably the greatest sports photo of all time. Ali gesturing and standing over Liston down on the ground. Iconic black and white photo yelling at him to get up and fight, sucker. No one will believe this. Epic photo. You see people with that painting. That photo in their homes, you see people wearing hoodies with that. Um, it was a great photo, amazing photo. Um, and it was at arguably the greatest shot of the greatest athlete of all time, right? So that's a pretty that's a pretty cool thing to have um, uh, come out of this. And I'll also say this. At the end of the day, the only thing meaningful that came out of Patrick Ewan going to New York was him getting posterized by Michael Jordan 15 different times. <laughs> wait, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't, we're, not, we're not weighing in on each other's theories here. <laughs> Hey, listen, I, I'll love, have, I'll have I love the last court. dance as much as everybody else, but I've I've seen him get dunked on 15 times in that documentary. Okay. Oh God, yeah. Scotty Pippen just worked him over. And Scotty Pippen, it wasn't even Jordan working him over. It was Scotty. I mean, yes, I agree with you on that. Yeah, well, all right. Let's let's get back to order here. All right. This is a very official courtroom uh, with your guy Matt Harmon here. But Jay, Jay. I'm going to go back to you here now. Second question, what, is your fallout bigger than Therese? What is the fallout from this incident? Well, my personal fallout is I was growing up in Atlanta, and I had the chance to have Patrick Ewing and Dominique Wilkins on the same team. That's some fallout for me. But uh, Let's not get personal. Let's stick to the other, facts. Exactly. On a larger <laughs> scale, Patrick Ewing absolutely changed the course of the NBA in New York. He, he led the Knicks to 13 straight playoff appearances, two finals appearances. Yes, he did get worked over in both 
both of those finals appearances, but let's put that aside right now. He did lead the Knicks back to not just relevance, but prominence. They were right up there. They obviously ran into the Bulls all the time as they were climbing, but he, he made the Knicks a relevant team. Now, granted, they haven't been a relevant team for 20 years, and a lot of people, not a lot of Knicks fans still believe that they are, but for a while, Patrick Ewing was one of the biggest stars in the biggest city in the country, sports-wise, and so, yeah, from that standpoint, he completely reshaped the NBA, that one draft. Imagine if Patrick Ewing had ended up in Sacramento. Imagine if he'd ended up in Indiana. It would have been a whole different NBA. I'll also be fair. Like, I'll also be fair. His, his Knicks teams in the early 90s were very memorable. And it's not entirely his fault that they didn't give him a legit second banana the whole time he was there. But still, he's known for getting dunked on. <laughs> I, well, I, I would take Charles Oakley over Sonny Liston myself. So I think he might too. That's probably fair. Yeah, I definitely would do that. I'm not going to lie. But <laughs> here's one thing that you know about Oak. Oak is a guy that you want with you in the alley. You want yes. that. Yes. You don't have to worry about a dive with Oak. No, no. I would I would like to see how Oak took a, an Ali punch, but I think Ali's hand would be hurting after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm ready to reach my final decision here. And let's just recap. Obviously, we're discussing whether the phantom punch or the frozen envelope is the greatest conspiracy theory in sports. Although I feel like we've kind of moved the, the, the <laughs> lens here on what we're talking about. But <laughs> I want to refer to the official definition, the dictionary definition of a conspiracy. It's a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. Uh, I don't know that actually, theoretically, either one of these was was like harmful, but whatever. That's not the point. Uh, I think that Therese convinced me that his thing definitely happened. Uh, I, I like, I, I'm quite sure that this guy took the dive, but, with that being said, I think if we're oh. saying which the better conspiracy theory oh. in sports, <laughs> Jay, Jay got Jay got me with with the with the bent envelope thing and how it connected oh. back to <laughs> the fix is like in. the group that owned Nick. I'm I'm look again, Therese, I think you convinced me that this thing legit went down, but I think Jay sold me on a better conspiracy theory. <laughs> and maybe I've just been talking to uh, some of my relatives, sharing some things on Facebook that are not not correct. Uh, but in my view, a conspiracy theory is something that, you know, maybe it happened, probably it didn't. I don't know. But Jay, I think, sold me on a better conspiracy theory, although I believe that Therese's was more iconic and also definitely true. <laughs> You know what? I'm going to appeal to the Yahoo Sports Board of Commissions. This is the fix is in on this verdict. I got both I got both co-hosts appealing or like convi- uh, appealing to uh, against me. What is what am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> I got a hunch Jay's going to withdraw. That's right. I got I got I got my win now. I'm withdrawing my appeal. <laughs> All right, well, Jay, final statements from you before we wrap this up. I just, you know, take a victory lap. Well, I did I did have a, a, a one last dunk to make, you know, in, in the sense that, uh, but I've already won. So I, I'm going to hold off by saying, you know, by, by not saying that Patrick rhymes with Nick and Ewing has five letters and, you know, it also has five letters, David Stern. I mean, it's all right there okay. in front of us. All right, don't, you already eyes. won. Open don't, your don't. eyes. Don't don't dampen the evidence here with that one. Come on, you can we'll strike that from the official record. One of my assistants will do that over here. Can I make a quick statement before I go? Yes, you may. I don't care what harm and rules. <laughs> Bailiff, throw the this champ man. is here. The champ is here. Throw this man from the courtroom. All right. Well, for Jay Busby, for Therese Paler, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Boxed In. This show comes out every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three times a week, wherever you get your podcast. So subscribe and uh, we'll see if they let me be a judge again after I seem to just uh, leave at least one person in every show uh, very upset. 